Good afternoon and welcome to this joint event between the European Policy Centre and the Egmont Institutes, where we will discuss today Social Europe post the Portal Social Summit, what now and where next. My name is Aileen McLeod. I am Associate Director and Head of the Social Europe and Wellbeing Programme at the EPC, where I work mainly on Social Europe issues, wellbeing policy in the context of new economic thinking and models and health issues and I have the very real pleasure of moderating today's event. Now, Social Europe has been the bedrock of EU integration for the last 30 years and is one of the main pillars really since the Maastricht Treaty. This is arguably more true today than any time in the past because of the profound economic, social and environmental challenges the EU faces from increasing socioeconomic inequalities, accelerating climate and environmental crisis, the rapid technological change that we're facing, the new global trade dynamics, and the demographic transformation. And on top of this, we have the devastating COVID-19 crisis, which has exposed the vulnerabilities and the lack of resilience of our health, economic, financial, social, and political systems. Now against this backdrop, the first social summit in nearly four years was held in Porto on the 7th and 8th of May, where expectations were high. And it was hoped that the gathering would offer an important political signal by EU leaders that the EU's post-COVID recovery would be a socially inclusive and fair one. Now, while all 27 EU heads of governments committed themselves to EU social targets on jobs, skills and poverty reduction, the challenge really is to so what will become a reality. So I am delighted to be joined today for this 60 minute dialogue by Commissioner Nicholas Schmidt, who is the European Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights, and by Maria Hiroi Rodriguez, who is currently the President of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies. She's also a former Portuguese Minister of Employment and a former MEP and Vice President of the Socialist and Democrats Group in the European Parliament, where she was instrumental in establishing the declaration of the European Pillar of Social Rights at Gothenburg in 2017. So we're delighted to have two such distinguished guests with us. Both the Commissioner and many of our guests will reflect on the outcomes of the Portal Social Summit, their expectations for the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan and its place in the recovery and the next steps for social Europe. The list is an interactive one. Uh, after the, the, the dialogue between the, the Commissioner and Maria Rodriguez, I will open up the floor to the audience for questions. And you can do this in two ways. You can write your questions in the Q&A box as they occur to you. So please don't wait until the end before putting your questions. And if you can also keep them as short as possible, it would be wonderful for me because that makes it a lot easier for me to read them out and also to try and ensure that I fit in as many people as possible. And if you're not feeling too shy, you are very welcome to raise your virtual hand and my colleagues will give you the floor. And five minutes before this event is due to end, I will bring in Jean-Louis de Brouwer, who's the Director of the European Affairs Programme at the Eggman Institute, just to say a few concluding remarks. So I'm conscious that our time is short. So without further ado, I shall now hand over to Commissioner Schmidt and to Maria Hioia Rodriguez to begin their discussion. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, for the invitation, and also thank you very much for organizing this uh, this exchange on on the Porto summit and and the importance of of this summit. Well, I I just want to recall very briefly uh, uh, the way from uh, Göteborg to to Porto, because as you you have said, uh, Göteborg was uh, was finally. Uh, a very important moment. And I must say when uh, I was in Göteborg because at that time I was a Minister of Social of, of Labour and Social Affairs, um, I, I must say I, I, I feared that it would just be one moment of a declaration and then it would be lost. And thanks to uh, uh, a lot of people and thanks also to the President of the Commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, who really pushed for this uh, pillar of social rights, but also thanks to the European Parliament and the Committee in the European Parliament uh, and uh, Maria uh, Rodriguez. Finally, Göteborg was the beginning. 
And uh, I, uh, I, I must say that uh, this commission, um, uh, one of the most valuable heritage we got from the previous one is without any doubt the pillar of social rights, because uh, uh, this uh, was the beginning of uh, a new stage, a new step for social Europe. And uh, I, um, when the president of the commission, Madame von der Leyen decided to have this action plan on the social pillar, that was uh, uh, the second important uh, step uh, uh, because this was also some kind of a guarantee that this, uh, uh, this uh, pillar of social rights would uh, have a strong follow-up. And uh, so we have, uh, uh, worked on this uh, on this uh, action plan, and uh, I must say sometimes uh, in politics there are positive uh, things coming together. And one of the very positive uh, uh, evolution was the fact that uh, the Portuguese uh, had the presidency, and uh, and and the Portuguese prime minister he was committed uh, to convene this summit uh, in Porto, because this uh, would uh, in a way confirm uh, the commitment towards the pillar, but also in an active way, not just to the principles, but also to the way how these principles should be, uh, should be implemented. And this is uh, obviously uh, uh, a strong merit of, uh, of the Portuguese presidency and, and namely of the Portuguese prime minister who was really very much strongly supporting this summit and also uh, the content of this su uh, summit. Now, uh, the, the action plan, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, presented by the commission in March, gives uh, uh, a, a certain number of important elements, how the pillar should be translated in actions, in concrete actions, some being more legislative, some being more policy actions, some being uh, uh, belonging to the initiatives of the commission, uh, like the minimum wage, but also uh, uh, the um, proposal we are working on, on platforms, uh, uh, proposals on health and safety, all these important elements, pay transparency uh, to guarantee uh, gender equality, some being more integrated in uh, different other policies. And uh, when uh, the idea of an action plan was launched, we could not expect uh, the... Uh, situation as it, uh, as it evolved uh, due to the pandemic and due to the crisis. So I think this uh, was a, a strong push also for, uh, for the social dimension because uh, uh, I think the, the awareness that uh, we, we need in Europe also a social dimension, that social is not just uh, uh, the business of member states, but that Europe has to play an active role also in social policy uh, has increased and has been uh, also strengthened due to the pandemic. Now, the results of Porto have already been mentioned. Uh, first, I must say the fact that this meeting has been has taken place is already uh, an important political signal because uh, it took from Göteborg to Porto uh, more than three years, three and a half years. So. Uh, 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 it, it was an important signal, a signal that uh, uh, um, uh, a summit, uh, an informal summit certainly, but in a summit of uh, heads and governments, uh, heads of state and governments uh, uh, focused on the social agenda. So this is the first thing. The second one is that uh, um, our action plan was uh, uh, in a way uh, endorsed but especially also the objectives, the main targets of this, uh, 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 of this action plan were uh, very much uh, supported. And this is now in a way a good basis for the commission to, uh, to work with member states, but also to, to work with social partners on the implementation of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, action plan and, and especially on the achievement of the three main targets being first, uh, uh, employment rate. So this implies and involves all issues around uh, job creation, about job policy, uh, employment policy. Second, on on skills, uh, this commission is very much committed to uh, to push for um, more investment in people, more investment in skills, more investment in uh, uh, upskilling, uh, and uh, this involves, by the way, not just uh, 
Uh, my uh, DG, this involves also other DGs. We have a very good cooperation, uh, for instance, with uh, Commissioner Breton uh, and uh, his idea of ecosystems, uh, how we can push for uh, reskilling policies in the, in the different uh, economic uh, ecosystems. And then the third one is poverty, because poverty finally uh, was already an objective under 2010-2020. Uh, uh, there were improvements, but these improvements have been blocked by uh, and stopped by, by the, by the uh, present crisis. But uh, there was some uh, improvements uh, in reducing the number of, uh, of people uh, in, uh, at risk of poverty. Now we have uh, uh, a realistic, uh, some consider it to be a too modest uh, objective to reduce poverty by 15 million and especially 5 million children. Uh, this is at least, uh, uh, it, this is uh, a realistic objective, but certainly it would be uh, uh, better to uh, finally uh, by 2030 uh, to, uh, to go further than these numbers. Uh, and I think this is also a very strong message. Uh, by the way, poverty and jobs are very much connected. If we, uh, uh, if we are successful on creating jobs, in bringing more people in quality jobs, well, we will be successful on poverty. Uh, if we are successful on uh, better investing in people, on their qualification, on their skills, we will be, uh, it will be easier to bring people in, in, into the labor market and into jobs. So these three objectives are interlinked between and they, uh, they have uh, a lot of other connections. And um, uh, to, to, to finish, um, uh, it's not only these three uh, major targets, it's also a renewed scoreboard. And this uh, is a very good and useful tool just to, uh, uh, to uh, follow up uh, on social policies in the uh, member states. Uh, this is about poverty, this is about skills, this is about uh, inequality, this is about uh, also jobs. Uh, and therefore, uh, the Commission uh, has uh, uh, reviewed its scoreboard, and uh, we want to use this scoreboard very actively, also in the context in the context of uh, of the uh, of the semester. And I I, I just uh, uh, close to say uh, that uh, uh, there is a commitment now by uh, the heads of state uh, to uh, uh, to close to close uh, to closely following the progress achieved towards the implementation of the European pillar of social rights uh, and the headline targets. Uh, and uh, they, are, they have committed themselves to do that, including, uh, I quote, including at the highest level. So probably we will have more regularly summits uh, dealing with social issues, which gives us also uh, a push and a support uh, to, uh, 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 in, in these areas and uh, also uh, uh, to continue working on a renewed semester because we, we need this tool of the semester which combines the fiscal, the economic and the social dimension, Bring them, brings them together because you cannot just se separate the economic side from the social side. The, these are the two sides of, of the same coin, including also the fiscal aspect, uh, the budgetary aspect, uh, uh, and, and especially in a time where we have to reflect uh, what uh, kind of new budgetary rules have to apply once we are uh, out of this crisis and the recovery is successful. So I, uh, these are in a nutshell uh, about Porto and the doors opened by the summit and the conclusions of Porto. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for those uh, opening remarks. And if I just bring in um, Maria Rodriguez, and you know, because you may have some some questions and some dialogue that you'd like to uh, to pursue with the Commissioner, uh -huh. Maria. Uh, many thanks, first of all, to uh, Egmont Institute and the PPC for organizing this uh, interesting uh, gathering. And uh, I'm particularly pleased uh, to join the Commissioner. Uh, because uh, uh, we have been through together so many episodes of developing social Europe. This is another one. And uh, I was asked uh, to come with uh, some thoughts and also some questions and to conduct this as a kind of chat. 
donc, euh, cher ami Nicolas, on pourrait euh, poursuivre en français notre euh, langue euh, habituelle pour euh, poursuivre le, le dialogue entre nous. Uh, but uh, we'll go on chatting in, in English. And I would like to start um, by the uh, face the photo, of course. Uh, but I think we could go through um, the further implications of photo summit, what is the kind of dynamics which can be created in order to respond to, to the COVID uh, crisis unfolding, where we still have some scenarios to come out of this crisis. And then uh, perhaps it would be interesting to take a longer term perspective, putting the pillar in the experience of uh, the European project to highlight how can the pillar bring a kind of leap forward, also in view of the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe. So Nicola, I don't know if you agree, if you are willing to talk about this, but uh, I was asked to come with uh, this kind of um, topics for our conversation. Absolutely, <laughs> in the language you choose. <laughs> Uh, so a pleasure really to be with you again. Uh, look, uh, on Porto, uh, I belong to those who think this was a very good summit uh, with important outcomes. And uh, this also due to your, your great work. It was very important to have a plan to implement the social pillar on the table of um, the European institutions, but also the organized civil society. Um, this was really due after our effort for Gothenburg summit. Uh, and I think uh, that this choice of these three particular targets uh, is a good one. I know this is very difficult to select the, the right kind of targets. Mm -hmm. There are many pros and cons, there are risks. Uh, but all in all, I think these three are the good ones, I believe, to create uh, a new dynamics. And then according to the promise of the pillar, uh, these targets should be met by um, a very precise set of concrete measures who put the 20 principles of the pillar into motion. Um, so many of these measures are there. Probably some others are still missing, but I'm sure they will come. Uh, example, dealing with the senior citizens in Europe, perhaps we need some more measures. This is just an example. But all in all, most of the target groups are covered with very important uh, measures. And then I also underline um, the governance model, which was uh, uh, launched by the Porto Summit, uh, because in fact, something like a social pillar depends on the role of the European institutions, but also depends a lot on social partners and organized civil society. And so that's why this kind of uh, model of bringing all these actors together was uh, really important. And I also hope uh, we can have a, a regular, monitoring of involving and engaging all these actors because without these it's not easy to have success in all these operations. Um, my question for you um, because the plan is a, a quite comprehensive one and, and uh, with a long list of measures in fact, my question for you is about now the sequence to make the best of these dynamics launched by Porto. Uh, in a nutshell, the question is, which are your plans to implement the plan? Well, <laughs> can you elaborate on this? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we have to have a plan to, to implement the plan. I, I fully agree with that. And, and finally, we, we, we have indicated uh, how we, uh, we intend to implement the plan. Uh, we, we all know that uh, there are uh, a lot of measures uh, which uh, 
which are needed in many sectors. We have 20 principles, so this covers a lot of aspects of economic and social life, uh, which are reflected also in the, uh, in the action plan. Um, and uh, the action plan, by the way, is not just a plan for this commission. The action plan uh, goes uh, up to 2030. So uh, we have also paved a bit the way for the next commission, although we have foreseen in the action plan itself that uh, there might be a revision uh, 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 once the new commission uh, takes over. So I think there, there has been a, a revolving aspect in, in, in this work. Now, what, what are the, uh, the, the main uh, issues which uh, uh, we will deal with now. Uh, 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 given that we have to connect this action plan very much to the other different policies in uh, which are which are uh, conducted in uh, in the uh, 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 by the European Union, and uh, the plan cannot be separated, for instance, from the uh, uh, from the. Uh, um, uh, recovery and uh, resilience plan, uh, because uh, we have insisted a lot that uh, uh, the uh, social aspects uh, should be integrated also in the national uh, in the national uh, uh, recovery plans. And uh, obviously, also uh, the uh, member states have uh, have followed this uh, because, uh, uh, for instance, employment policies skilling policies are very much uh, uh, present in the different national uh, plans. Uh, what uh, uh, the second one is that uh, uh, this commission is very much committed to, uh, to strengthen the economic base and, and especially the industrial base in Europe. Uh, so uh, uh, there is a strong connection with uh, industry policy, industrial policies and uh, the social, uh, the social uh, uh, aspect first on skilling, but also on health and safety, but also on uh, uh, labor rights, uh, uh, how uh, 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 work is organized in a, in a period of uh, big transformation of uh, the world of work. And that's uh, one of our next issues will be uh, a new strategy for health and safety, but then followed by a proposal, probably a directive on uh, on um, uh, on platforms, and I think this is a, a crucial element uh, of the uh, uh, recent evolution in our economies. That's the uh, the development of uh, uh, of um, uh, platforms and uh, uh, what the working conditions are uh, for this platform. So we are now in a process of consultation on how such a, a legal instrument should be uh, should be. Uh, shaped uh, to give uh, also social rights uh, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, platform uh, workers. Now, another aspect which is very important and we are working on it is uh, gender equality because uh, employment and gender has a, a very strong connection. We have certainly um, the, the need for bringing more women into the labor market, into jobs, especially in some countries where the numbers are still low. And that's what uh, also this, uh, this objective of 78% uh, uh, has to translate because we can, many countries can only achieve this by bringing more women into that. And this means that we also have to reflect how uh, a professional life and private life has to be combined. And this is a, a proposal which uh, was already uh, tabled by the previous commission on, on, on uh, the um, how, how you can combine private life and professional life. But this means also investments in structures like care, child care, but not only child care. So we have to rethink a lot of uh, aspects in that context. And we will come up uh, with uh, proposals also uh, on this uh, in this uh, in this area. Uh, now, um, uh, poverty. Uh, uh, we have launched already uh, a proposal on a recommendation on child poverty because this is a uh, one aspect uh, we want to focus on. Uh, I think that we are about now to reach an agreement on a, a child guarantee. This means that it has to be implemented, and you know. Like always, well, we propose, we make proposal, we make recommendation, but we, uh, but then member states uh, have to uh, 
uh, to implement and, and to stop here, uh, just uh, homelessness. Homelessness is an issue which has come up all over Europe. Uh, as I say, we the commission might not have a large competence uh, in housing and, and the, the issue like homeless, but uh, uh, we, 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 we see that this has become a European problem. So we, we I think we can also activate more uh, added value policies in this area. And we will have a, a, a meeting in Lisbon on homelessness, and we will certainly come with proposals. We will activate uh, exchanges between member states. Uh, we will also try to uh, bring some money on that uh, to create the right incentives uh, for cities, for regions, uh, to invest more uh, to, uh, to combat uh, homelessness. So these are a lot of elements. Uh, uh, skills is, is a permanent uh, um, uh, element in our policies like employment, we have to reflect uh, uh, on, on uh, we have made a recommendation on employment policy called EASE, which is a, a new approach uh, for managing transitions, because we are in a big transition, economic one, but also in terms of jobs, uh, jobs are changing, jobs are uh, transformed, there are jobs disappearing due to the uh, uh, digital or to the greening of our economy. How can we manage labor markets uh, better in this period of transitions. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm advocating mobility, but I'm more reluctant to say, well, labor markets have to be uh, just flexible and this will sort out all the problems. So I think we, we have to have a, a, a stronger uh, tools to, uh, uh, to uh, manage uh, this transition. So these are a lot of elements which uh, are reflected in the action plan and uh, on which we will work. We will work with social partners, as, to, as you have said, we have to work with uh, civil society. That's the case, for instance, on poverty, uh, child poverty, but also homelessness. And we have to work uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, member states very actively. Uh, and, and, and I think this is uh, the big challenge is uh, uh, the importance of the Council of uh, Labour Ministers and Social Affairs Ministers. They have an, a lot of work to do. Uh, they have an important role to play uh, also in the future governance uh, of the Union, including also uh, when we will come to uh, review uh, uh, or adapt uh, the, the rules in, 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 uh, connected to, uh, to uh, monetary and economic union. Thank you very much, uh, dear Commissioner. Look, um, I'll just uh, pick one or two issues you just referred to, uh, because it, it seems to me that uh, uh, the situation we are in now is that on one hand, we are still coping with the recession created by the COVID crisis. So we need to save jobs and viable companies and uh, an instrument like sure you have worked a lot on is extremely uh, important for this but at the same time we are already uh, shaping the the transformation to cope with the green and digital transition so i know this is not easy hmm? uh, and my question is um, how we how you combining these two objectives saving jobs but also creating the conditions for new kind of jobs. Um, the second question is about the green transition and the, and the digital, because it seems to me that the green transition will um, put some jobs at, at risk and can create new jobs in new sectors, new activities. Uh, when it comes to digital, the situation we have is a bit different because I believe that the digital will transform all sectors and the platform work is just a start. Uh, but the risk is there that uh, if uh, we don't have quick action, platform work will be a work without rights. So these are challenging objectives for a commission of social affairs and for minister of social affairs right now. How are you coping with this at the same time? 
Well, it's, <laughs> as you said, everything at the same time. Uh, well, on, the, on your first question, uh, saving jobs and creating jobs. Uh, I, 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 I agree that uh, we have quite well managed uh, uh, the fact that uh, a lot of jobs have been saved, but not just the jobs have been saved, companies have been saved. Uh, because uh, I think that uh, if we hadn't, uh, nationally speaking, but there were, there were also some supports coming from Europe, uh, uh, from the European Union uh, to save companies, uh, uh, we would have lost uh, 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 part of our economic substance, especially as MEs struggling uh, badly to survive. So saving jobs, and you mentioned it, that was uh, sure. And sure was born uh, in this uh, crisis a bit inspired by this idea of uh, unemployment insurance uh, uh, instrument we, uh, we often talked about, uh, but then uh, we, we invented something new, which was targeted uh, to the uh, uh, crisis situation. And, and, and finally, all the member states, which, which is something which should, should not be underestimated. All member states introduced short-time work schemes. This was not the case absolutely not the case during the previous crisis. This was done in a very short time. So all the member states did that. And they did it also uh, with the support of the, uh, the union, uh, with the support of the Sure uh, 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 funds, uh, 100 billion euros. Uh, I've seen uh, we are now, we have now nearly uh, spent all, all this money to uh, 19 member states who asked for this money, the others doing it without taking uh, European funding, but uh, uh, all uh, did this. Now we are phasing out uh, this short time work, which is fine. And at the same time, we have to make sure that uh, uh, people will find, uh, will keep their job or prepare them to change their job. And that's what we did when we proposed this uh, uh, recommendation, but uh, 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 employment uh, uh, measures uh, we call ease precisely to accompany the transitions uh, you referred to. And uh, because we all know that uh, some jobs will not come back uh, even after the recovery, but at the same time, we, there will be a, a lot of new jobs created. Uh, the recovery is strong in some areas, in some sectors, and, and some sectors are looking for people and so we have to facilitate this transition. So I think creating jobs also is a question of investment. So this is partly uh, uh, has been uh, uh, supported by, by the uh, recovery and resilience facilities and uh, the, the national plans uh, to accompany the recovery and, and encouraging uh, companies to create jobs and, and especially to hire people, uh, especially also young people. So a very strong focus on uh, youth uh, employment. And you know very well, you, you are one of the mothers of the youth guarantee. So uh, you know how, how important uh, 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 youth employment is. On the green and the digital, uh, I, I agree that uh, uh, this applies also, this transition, managing the transition, uh, especially to the green, uh, there are a lot of uh, skills uh, needed, so reskilling is absolutely indispensable, especially in those areas where we have to close down activities. Coal is one example, but not the only. We have sectors in a big transformation, like the automotive sector, going from the traditional engine to electric engine, which has a lot of consequences uh, for uh, the way how, how cars are, are produced and, and what kind of skills are needed. Batteries is a good example. Uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs will be created in, uh, in, in, in the battery industry. And these people have to be skilled. We need more engineers. We need more uh, specialized workers for the battery industry. And uh, we are now working on, on the skilling uh, pact uh, also for the, uh, for the battery industry. On the digital, I think, you're right, this is uh, uh, something which is uh, uh, very comprehensive. All sectors are digital digitalizing from small companies to big ones. We have to support this in a way because uh, competitiveness is depending on it, but uh, the key of that is uh, giving people digital skills. And we are lacking digital skills in our economy. 
So we have to invest more in all kinds of uh, trainings, skilling, upskilling, and we have to take care of those who will not be able to follow this evolution. There will be losers of the digitalization, and we have to take care and also give them perspectives and job perspectives in other areas. So this is investing. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very much uh, uh, supportive to a social economy, to uh, to this sector of care. For instance, this is one aspect uh, uh, we have seen that the, the needs are, are high and we have to rethink. We, we will have a discussion in the next EBSCO Council on, on, this, on the care economy. So I think these are huge enterprises, but there are uh, a lot of new opportunities, but this, uh, 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 this uh, need a very active policies in, 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 the different, uh, in these different areas. Indeed, this is a, a complex uh, um, work, but uh, your reply is very interesting. Look, in fact, I have um, another question, uh, which is more on the longer term uh, perspective, uh, because uh, both of us were involved in, in several episodes in the past. Uh, and we can take this perspective. And now, of course, we also have the Conference on the Future of Europe about to start. Let me share with you some of my thoughts about, about this. Uh, I'm assuming that um, uh, Social Europe has been uh, translated into different um, objectives and instruments and basically to deal with three different kinds of problems. The first one for me is uh, the single market and the common monetary zone. And because of these, as you know, it was able to um, pass a very important set of uh, directives to develop a social fund to ensure social cohesion. Uh, and uh, when the Stability and Growth Pact was uh, introduced, uh, it was possible, by the way, under um, a Luxembourg EU presidency, to introduce the so-called European Employment Strategy to create a kind of a better balance with the Stability and Growth Pact. From my viewpoint, uh, this concern uh, is still there right now when you are putting on the table a proposal of minimum wage. And uh, when we speak about economic and monetary union, because this union is still incomplete. And we discussed a lot, I remember, how to introduce a stronger social dimension in the Eurozone. This is one, one front. The second is, the second concern is to conduct a, a transformation, a structural transformation in a coordinated way. The first attempt to do so was back in 2000 with the Lisbon strategy, then the U Europe 2020 strategy. Uh, now we have um, a green deal. Uh, and more recently in Porto, we start sketching a more comprehensive strategy driven by well-being. And I think this is a very important development where the social pillar will certainly play a central role. Finally, I see a third kind of concern, which is what should be done when we are coping with shocks. We had the big one 10 years ago with the Eurozone crisis. And I think, in fact, we learned a lesson. We learned the lesson that going to austerity will be counterproductive for all the purposes, not only for jobs and social conditions, um, but also for uh, rebalancing public budgets and growth mm, and promoting economic growth. So I believe that uh, now um, we are 
conducting a new approach, how to respond to a crisis. Uh, and I hope these tools will be developed. And this is my final comment, because all these uh, lessons should be translated in our discussion on the Conference on the Future of Europe, where I believe social Europe will be again a central uh, theme. And look, I was also very much involved in the Lisbon Treaty. I think the Lisbon Treaty um, has a potential, but also has limits. And I remember very well that we had no time to develop social Europe in the Lisbon Treaty. So my question for you is learning all these lessons from the past, how can we improve the architecture of European integration to have a Europe which is more balanced and more connected with citizens' concerns? Yeah, <laughs> that's a vast question. I know this will be for uh, three hours of talk, but uh... yeah, yeah, I, I will, I will do it in a few minutes. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I fully agree with you. I think these are all topics we we discussed already uh, uh, some time ago, and and which uh, remain. Uh, I think you you pointed out that there is one. Imp important and encouraging feature here that finally uh, some lessons were learned and uh, the reaction to this crisis has been different uh, from uh, from uh, the reaction to the previous one and uh, uh, we should not uh, stay now uh, halfway because okay we have reacted well with the uh, recovery fund breaking a lot of taboos by the way, sure was the the first taboo which was broken, because finally uh, we uh, we we took some uh, community uh, uh, loans, uh, uh, which were then uh, uh, given to to member states. So this this was done, uh, and I think that we have to build on that on the experience, uh, and it is clear that the uh, economic, fiscal, and social governance have to be reviewed. Uh, those who think that we just can go back uh, to what uh, was designed in the ninth, beginning of the 90s, uh, when the world was completely different, uh, we, went, we hadn't gone through a crisis like the first, the financial crisis, nor the crisis we are going through now, uh, that we just can come back to, uh, to the past uh, is, uh, is, would be, would be a, a big risk, would be really uh, the, the wrong way. So now we have to build on our experience and see how uh, this governance uh, should be, uh, should be um, uh, reshaped, redesigned. Uh, you have mentioned uh, uh, the stability pact. Well, the stability pact, which was uh, now de uh, deconnected uh, for a while, uh, it, it has been uh, launched in, in the early 90s, so the world is, 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 is totally uh, different. So I think this is the first thing uh, which has to be done, uh, connected to the Future of Europe conference, certainly, where we, we should now say, well, some things in the treaties have to be adapted, uh, uh, the governance has to be, should be precise, you know, there was a taboo, I remember very well, uh, uh, during the Lisbon uh, uh, negotiation, well, don't touch anything around the monetary union because everybody feared if you touch something there, the whole system might collapse and we might have uh, big discussions here. Now, I think uh, the Euro has uh, survived difficult times and difficult crises. Uh, it has resisted thanks to the fact that finally uh, we did not apply the treaties um, uh, a la lettre, how you say that, uh, a la lettre. Uh, this uh, because if, uh, if, uh, uh, if Mario Draghi uh, uh, had not been Mario Draghi, uh, but perhaps somebody else and would not have uh, done what he has done, well, we would uh, probably uh, not speak anymore about the Euro. 
And the same thing now for this crisis. So I think the world in that sense, also in, in, in relation to monetary policy, the linkage with budgetary policy, monetary policy, and the, also the social uh, aspect of that are important. So the shocks, uh, you cannot build something which is not shock resistant. Now, the, the word of resilience has, has entered the, the European language, uh, and, and, and rightly so, because resilience means the capacity to resist to shocks. But uh, resilience means that you have to get the, the tools, the instruments uh, to, to deal with shocks. And perhaps here, uh, there is a, certainly a need for, for, uh, for, for doing more. Uh, I think the convergence uh, is still a, an important topic uh, in Europe. We need more uh, economic convergence. We need more social convergence. Uh, and this is also something we still have to work on, especially in this period of big transitions, because this means that regions, but also member states, will be affected by these transitions in a very unequal way. Uh, and, and their capacity to resist to these transitions uh, will, uh, will be very different. So I think uh, in that sense, convergence uh, is important. And to stop uh, and uh, is, yes, the well-being uh, idea, which came up also uh, a bit in, in, in Porto, which was already mentioned in uh, conclusions by the European uh, Council before, I think this is a vision how Europe, uh, the European society should be. And I think when we are talking, we are not talking about technical aspects. We are talking about the life of millions of people. We are talking about a vision, how people would like to live uh, in, in this world. And the pandemic has brought new ideas and new dimensions and new threats uh, to, uh, uh, to that. And I think we, uh, we have the possibility as a European Union to connect with these feelings and these views of people, the citizens, and that for this future of Europe, uh, the debate can be useful. That depends on us also, uh, uh, how to, uh, to design a, a society, a system, which will be economically performing uh, fair and just, which is a big issue. Inequalities is, is remains in it, and also guaranteeing in a, a highly uh, uh, competitive and knowledge society to relate to a Lisbon strategy, uh, where uh, the well-being of people is is uh, is guaranteed. So this is a high ambition, but I think uh, it's now the momentum to work on that. We are in. We have a momentum. This is the perhaps there is nothing positive in the pandemic, but. Uh, uh, we should at least take this out, the momentum to, uh, to, to reshift certain things and, and, and also to bring Europe uh, in, a different, uh, uh, in a different perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Uh, so this is really a, a great uh, talk we are having, but now I believe this is my uh, moment to transfer to our moderator because perhaps there are some questions from uh, the other participants. It's up to you to tell, to tell us. Thank you very much, um, Maria. And, um, and I can say just a, a huge thank you to both you and, and the commissioner for sharing with us such a rich and insightful perspectives, not only in, in terms of the, the outcomes of the portal summit itself, but I also, I think, really underlining the importance and the necessity of ensuring that people and people's well-being are put first at the, at the centre of the EU's recovery post-COVID. And I think also the points have been made around, you know, cohesion and resilience as being key pillars of the EU that, you know, to make the EU more resilient for future crises, that we need to make it more social, strengthening social convergence, cohesion, resilience and solidarity across Europe and to ensure that the European pillar of social rights and its commitments, you know, in the action plan become a reality for all EU citizens, you know, embedding it fully into the implementation of, of the Green Deal and the recovery and the plans themselves. And I think the importance of moving that dial, you know, to solidarity and social inclusion, which is so essential, you know, if the EU is to, you know, live up to that promise of delivering a stronger social Europe that's focused on well-being and social justice for all EU citizens. I'm conscious that we have a, you know, we are running out of time um, and we do have a question that's uh, coming from the audience. Uh, and Commissioner, a question that we have here is about whether you think there is the possibility 
for a revised version of SURE and um, for that to become a, a permanent automatic stabiliser. Well, I, I, uh, I, I wouldn't say this is the permanent version of the, the present SURE instrument uh, because the, the SURE instrument was very much linked to the present crisis. Uh, but certainly we have to reflect on uh, uh, on uh, automatic or uh, uh, stabilizers in the monetary union because that was finally the origin of the uh, uh, the unemployment benefit insurance scheme was how can we introduce uh, in a monetary union where countries might be uh, affected by so-called asymmetric shocks uh, how can we bring in some more uh, 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 stabil uh, st stability elements or active uh, stabilizers. So certainly, this uh, this debate will uh, will will be uh, taken up again. Uh, we uh, we we together with Commissioner uh, Gentiloni, we 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 will work on that. Uh, now, as I said, the, the the priority is the recovery. But you, once you are in a recovery, you have to think about the next crisis, you know, and you have to plan uh, and uh, or better be but a bit better prepared because there are always things you cannot plan. And therefore, I would say that uh, certainly we, we, we will work on this issue and, uh, and see how this can be uh, put into place. Thank you. I'm conscious um, that we are running out of uh, time at the moment and we're coming to an end of our 60 minute dialogue. So at this point, I would like to ask, I think Jean-Louis de Brouwer, the director of the European Affairs Programme at the Egmont Institute, if he could just say a few concluding remarks on today's discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eileen. I, I was quite impressed by the conversation between Commissioner Schmidt and Madame Rodriguez. I mean, because I mean, it struck almost all the right points in relation with the way uh, what was achieved in Porto can be assessed. The Porto Summit is another milestone in the long term process of the development of an EU social policy. And it's fair to say that historically, the social dimension has had an unbalanced relationship with economic integration and was seen more as a byproduct of the benefits resulting from this economic integration. There were several steps in this protracted uh, process, typical of the permanent transaction between EU institutions and member states, which is the way the European agenda has been built over decennia. Clearly, after the remarkable achievement which marked the mandate of the Juncker Commission, in particular the Gutenberg Summit, one could have feared that there would have been a bit of a social fatigue. However, President van der Leyen in the, gui in the, the, the guidelines uh, for the new team that she presented in July 2019 presented a very ambitious renewed agenda. The first months of the present commissions were marked by initiatives aiming at launching the two major transitions, the green and the digital one, and then COVID-19 came in. After a first phase, a first phase of panic reaction, which Commissioner Schmidt was uh, labeled by one of your colleagues uh, as the toilet paper and pasta phase, uh, where member states rightly played the, their protective role, the EU came back in the picture and showed its capacity to support an emergency response. And you said it very rightly, one of the most spectacular achievement was the sure instrument for temporary support to mitigate unemployment and it was also a bit as a forerunner of the man of the moon moment i.e the presentation of the and the adoption of the next generation package clearly the twin transitions were still centerfold and the recovery and re of the resilience in the recovery and resilience strategy but very quickly uh, numerous stakeholders stood up to stress that there would be no such thing as a stable recovery and a genuinely resilient Europe if inequalities exacerbated by the pandemic and foreseeable societal changes were not properly addressed. So it was not about a double transition anymore, but a triple one, digital, green and social. Hence, of course, it makes sense uh, to say that the Porto Summit was the right meeting sending the right signal at the right moment. 
Of course, tensions shouldn't be underestimated, as illustrated by the non-paper of 11 member states. And their message was clearly, uh, that was okay, somewhat reflected uh, in the Porto Declaration, which itself reads indeed somewhat less forthcoming than the commitments signed up the day before. Now, what's next? Many ask the question, shall we have to wait another four years for the next uh, social uh, summit? Expectations uh, were expressed with regard, for instance, 2013, where we're going to have a double uh, Swedish-Spanish uh, uh, presidency of the European Union. And we witness these days how important the role of the rotating presidency can be. Bear in mind that Sweden was still a signatory of the non-paper of the 11 uh, I mentioned earlier, but still. And why not, after all, uh, the little member states I know best, Belgium in 2014, uh, 2024, I'm sorry, which co-signed with Spain uh, the uh, member Random or in, insisting uh, on the role uh, of uh, the expectation with regard to the EU in, uh, on delivering with the social agenda and the implementation of this action plan. But okay, are summits what we need? Of course, they are important because they are milestones, as I said earlier. They consolidate momentum in the evolution of the agenda. But the Commission can do a lot nowadays. I mean, the Commission can play a key role in the follow-up of the implementation uh, of uh, Lisbon. Uh, it, it can do so uh, in the approval process of the national resilience and recovery plans. I mean, they are now piling up on the table of the Commission, there is an approval process and there will be a monitoring process throughout uh, the duration of the next generation EU uh, package. The Commission can do a lot uh, by playing its role in the framework of the European semester mechanism, which is still the overall framework of the implementation of this strategy. The Commission can do a lot by securing convergence between the implementation of the NG, uh, next generation EU package and the cohesion instrument, because we still have the MFF and the different instrument in the framework of the MFF next to the next generation EU uh, initiatives. And of course, last but not least, you mentioned it, both of you, there is a conference on the future uh, of uh, Europe. Uh, I, okay, by the way, uh, the presidency, uh, the Portuguese presidency is not out of the wood, uh, because I understand that they will be on the 17th of June in Lisbon, a citizens event preceding the grand opening opening of the conference uh, in Strasbourg, where a series of citizens, including young citizens, will have the opportunity to express their views about uh, what the conference uh, can be and what the con on which could, should be the priority uh, of uh, the conference. Uh, I hope that they will be somewhat more focused and ambitious than apparently what the executive board decided as the main topics for the four planned citizens panel. There is one basket where you can find together strong economy, social justice, Justice, jobs education, youth, culture, sport, digital transformation, a little bit of a fourtou. So let's hope that they will be somewhat more focused on the employment and social situation. It should it should be there and it will be there. The last Eurobarometers in 2021 reveals that nine out of 10 European citizens do consider the social dimension as essential for them. And that will not certainly go down in the months to come. So I think that uh, there are numerous instruments in front of us and in front of the Commission in particular to ensure that whatever the resistance could be, while remaining strictly within the framework of and, and, the, and the competence, while abiding to the principle of subsidiarity, the Commission can play a major role in steering the process towards the full implementation of the social pillar and its action plan. I thank you very much, uh, uh, Aileen, for your moderation. I thank you very much, Commissioner Schmidt and my Madam Rodriguez, for this absolutely fascinating conversation. And uh, à suivre, as we say in French, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. you so much, um, Jean-Louis, for your uh, such thoughtful remarks to end our um, discussion today. I think many of the issues that you've raised, as well as those raised throughout the discussion, 
I think are certainly ones I'm sure that both Egmont and the EPC will be watching very closely and working on over the coming months. So I just want to conclude by thanking once again the, the Commissioner and Madame Morigues for sharing you know, such an insightful perspective on the importance of Social Europe with us today. And also just in terms of you know, setting out you know, the well-being being a vision of a society that people want to live in. Coming from a country that's pursuing a well-being economy approach in Scotland, this is a very welcome music to my ears. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to our audience and, uh, and for joining our discussion today. And we look forward to welcoming you back to our discussions again soon. And I wish you all a very good afternoon and a rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.